thank you to all of our speakers. I'm going to ask you guys to turn your cameras on and we're going to go into our question and answer panel. Um, so I have a few questions here, but um, audience, as we keep going, if you have more questions or comments, um, please write them into our chat box or our Facebook comments and we will try to get them answered. Um, but thank you everyone. I really appreciate um, all of your, your talks. They were great. Um, so the first question I have is for Susan. Uh, let's see, were the PAH, TPH data you provided based on analysis of water column concentrations or were they based on whole oil uh, concentrations? Uh, they were based on the uh, WAF and CWAF preparations, not on the oil themselves. The preparations okay. we did. Um, and a follow-up to that is how do your effects concentrations compare to actual field concentrations during the spill, particularly for dispersed oil? Well, that's kind of a loaded question because it depends on where you, uh, where you tested. But uh, when I went in the literature, so for the acute things, it was on the high end, moderate to high end, but still typical and within the bounds of other reported spills uh, for the 24 hour period. If that answers your question. Absolutely. Uh, so Mario and uh, Roz, we uh, kind of have one for you and feel free to expand on it. Um, do you see the industry and sort of current aquaculture methods as more resilient in the event of another oil spill? So we've, we've dealt with these challenges in the past and we've kind of changed and progressed. What do you, what's our current state in that? Ross? Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, um, sorry, I'll let Ross go first. Okay, uh, so in, in my in my opinion, uh, resilient as in the the aspect that you can take the oysters and the cages out of the water in the event of a spill. But you know, how like how long would that take? How what would a spill look like if it was a spill with magnitude of BP? How long could those oysters survive in those areas with the oysters being out of the water? Is it is it kind of a loaded question? It's a bit tricky to answer. Um, are we, is the industry more resilient that, that you know, mariculture is in place? In my opinion, if we had an event like BP, I would say no, just because of the length, hopefully for the world's sake, that never ever happens again anywhere in the world. But um, uh, it's, you know, more oysters are better in my opinion. So it's, it's a difficult question to answer. So maybe Mario can give a, a better opinion than me. Um, well, the things about it is, um, for example, um, an Apalachicola, I don't know if, um, if y'all are familiar with that. Um, what happened was um, the Apalachicola's, uh, Apalachicola's uh, uh, pop oyster population collapsed in the advent of BP, not that because it hit BP, just because um, legislation was put in to, um, open, to allow open harvesting because the, uh, the governor thought that, that, the, that BP oil was going to hit. So, um, it never came back, but it really just comes down to um, to preparation. For example, um, mariculture. Um, yes, uh, the it allows the oysters to be mobile, um, and you can pull them out. But the thing is, if a beep like just like Ross was saying, um, it's not one of those overnight things. Um, it would take months and months to um, to uh, to fix, and even then, you're still going to get some of the uh, effects staying there. Um, you can move them. Um, you can actually move them. Let's say it were to hit Texas, you could move them to, it's possible to move them to a different state, but um, there's so much, um, there's just so many rules and regulations that I doubt that it would move it. So resiliency, um, I don't think it would, I don't think it would improve um, just because of the rules and regulations put in place. Um, yeah, so. That's just my answer. No, no, it's good. It's good to hear the, the perspective. We, we appreciate that. Um, I've got a question. Uh, how can we link the information that our scientists have found to the industry and mariculture? And um, I would love to get everybody's opinion on this one. Uh, 
I think that's a great question. Um, and if you don't recognize the name, Heather was one of the scientists who did the work that I talked about. Um, so I'm glad that she's on and, and was listening. Uh, you know, I think this is something we all, all struggle with because we have these great little bits of information, even prior to the oil spill and separate from the oil spill, that's, you know, information about oyster physiology and, and conditions for growth and, and all of these other things. And uh, I think there's always, it's always a challenge to figure out how to get that information into the hands of whether it's a, you know, a grower or maybe more importantly, marine resources or some kind of manager um, and get it out there in a way that's also um, accessible. Uh, so hopefully doing something like this, you know, we hope that if they're, whether someone is watching live or maybe you can go back and, and watch later. Um, and I certainly hope if anybody does have uh, questions or interest in any of our work or even assimilating, because I know it can be complicated to take the information from say one of, of our individual papers and actually figure out how that pertains to a real question now. Um, I'm always happy to to answer questions or talk to somebody. Um, so I hope that somebody would contact us and ask those kinds of questions. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to ideas because I think that's a tough one. We, we agree at Sea Grant and that's absolutely what we, we try to do. Uh, we try to take this research and we try to make it uh, as relevant as possible. And, and so as Ruth said, we, we love you joining for these presentations. Um, we have many more um, bulletins and resources online feel free to always contact, uh, as Ruth said, herself or uh, your Sea Grant representatives, myself. We're, we're here to kind of help um, find a way to best use the information from both sides of the team. Um, and I'll let, I'll let everybody else keep going with that. Yeah, that's one of the problems that I actually would see um, uh, when I was doing my doctoral work was that um, you see papers that are just there or, um, or researchers that actually did really good research. Um, like Ruth and Susan, but um, the thing is that sometimes it just stays in the in the in the hallways of academia, and it's not really going out to the to the users, um, the people that can actually. I mean, uh, it's 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 really important information. Um, but one thing we we do here at Sea Grant, and uh, it's kind of my job, is to link all the different stakeholders from academics to uh, growers, processors, industries, restaurateurs, um, just to get the information out there. And if there's questions that the that the uh, that the users have, for example, a grower, um, I can go to one academic and ask them, or really just trying to disseminate the information as clearly as possible. Um, and that's kind of what we do here at Sea Grant. But also using the tools available. For example, uh, Danny's done a really good job in using the technology that's available to us, um, just so that I mean, how else can you have thirty attendees um, that can just get together and just kind of discuss this? So. It's really just um, linking linking stakeholders together and using the technology that's um, that's available to us. And unfortunately, we're we're finally using the technology due to a horrible pandemic. But um, we're finally kind of starting to uh, exercise the technology that's always been available to us. So. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? No, we've um, a. I'm in the aquaculture division actually at, uh, at Harbor Branch. And um, so it's being applied research. We disseminate a lot of things at meetings that include industry members like the National Shell Fisheries Association and oyster industry meetings. Uh, but yeah, there really isn't a, a one-stop shop that somebody can, can go to and uh, you know, I, I, there's so much out there, I don't know how you would, would even begin to do that. Absolutely, there's, there's a never ending amount of resources out there. And, and so we're, we're here to try to help and clarify um, and reach, reach out to people, talk to people, um, get connected with the community as, as all of these people are and, and let us know how we can help you guys um, in all of these connections between um, our industry, our aquaculture, and our, our scientific environment. Um, so I have another question for Roz. Uh, how many acres of mariculture oysters are prestige oysters planning to grow, and how does that compare to the acreage production of prestige wild oyster leases, if you're comfortable sharing that with us? 
Yeah, um, as, as far as on the wild side, so we have about 40,000 acres of private oyster grounds between Texas and Louisiana. And actually we do have some acreage in, in Florida and have much cold as well. Um, we haven't actually decided on an, ex an exact number of aquaculture that we're going to grow here in the state of Texas. Those rules and regulations just kind of came out um, earlier this summer and uh, it's a bit raw. So we're breaking, breaking down that and trying to find an understanding of site location. Um, and there's a lot of variables that come into play. Uh, but like I said, it's a, it's a niche market. I don't think it, from, from my perspective, we will be starting on a, on a, with a large farm. I think it's something that we would grow into, uh, small acreage really to complement our wild fishery. Uh, but it's, it's something we're, we're, we're heavily looking at and, and, and wanting to do. So uh, to give you a short answer, don't have an exact acreage yet, but it will not be 40,000 acres. Excellent. Uh, so Susan, I have another question for you. Um, can the dispersant itself also have impact on the larval stages? So just if you could review a little bit more of that information. Yeah, it can, but oysters being uh, near shore estuarine species and uh, the dispersant, I kind of hesitated even comparing the, the oil versus the dispersed oil with oysters, but we worked with other species where it was a lot more appropriate to do. Um, so yes, it does have an effect in and of its own, but we didn't feel it was really appropriate to take a look at that for oysters because they're so near shore and the dispersant isn't used that close in shore. Gotcha. But it did for other things that we looked at, yes. Interesting. Okay. Um, and I have a question from the Gulf of Maine. Awesome. I work with oyster farmers in the Gulf of Maine. What data do you wish you had before the BP spill occurred? Um, and are there long-term monitoring projects that would be good to establish so that you could compare oyster health before and after a spill? Well, that's which, what everybody would like to have, but the funding for that is practically non-existent. The most you get is two years, maybe three if you're lucky, to, to monitor an area for health and, and density and, uh, you know, spawning activity and all that. Uh, so that, that's always a gap, and uh, funding is the issue. Most of us are not self-funded. And I think monitoring is extremely underrated. Uh, you know, we, did, we had a, a severe lack of baseline, we call baseline data, before the spill for a great many things. I think that awareness, you know, is one good thing that came out of the spill that we got, you know, a, 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 just a greater awareness that we need basic information about all different kinds of ecos parts of our ecosystem and critters and, and all different things that are going on. But, um, you know, it's it's the eternal battle. I mean, all the funding agencies want to fund the next great thing, you know, cure cancer and color, well, uh, and then move on. Uh, nobody wants to fund what is perceived as doing the same thing over and over again. Even monitoring post-restoration, I mean, I think most of us would probably share this experience here on the Gulf Coast that, you know, we were being pressured to define harm without baselines and then talk about what needed to be restored and start restoring before we even had finished defining harm, much less thinking about, okay, then how do we monitor for success of restoration afterward? Which, how do you do that if you don't know what was there and what was harmed, right? So it's this sort of negative feedback loop. Uh, and I think that this is something that, I, you know, this, I'm gonna get on this little soapbox here, but I think everybody needs to, to fight for this, fight for the value of long-term data sets for monitoring that put us in a good position to better assess harm when something happens, whether it's a hurricane or an oil spill or any other kind of event that might happen in the future or climate change or whatever. And then, you know, allow us to have that monitoring continue on, especially if we're talking about restoration and recovery. Um, so I think if we can find a way to get the folks with the purse strings to be willing to put as much value on monitoring as we do on these next new great discoveries, I think that would be a, a, a fabulous thing. So definitely the, the funding. What about if you had unlimited funding? What was something you'd like to, like to add? 
We'll keep our fingers crossed that unlimited funding for science will come. Anything specific? All the things, I guess. <laughs> we, want, we want to do all the things. <laughs> Grow all the oysters, study all the things. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really tough, um, tough question. I think because we each, you know, you have to keep in mind too, we all each have our own sort of spheres of research. And so, you know, what I would do with unlimited funding, I'm sure is very different than what Susan would do with unlimited funding and anybody else that you would ask that question to, because probably we would just, basically keep doing what we're doing, just do more of it more comprehensively and see previous answer about, you know, long-term consistent monitoring and know that we could have the, the manpower to do that. Absolutely. Great. Um, I think that concludes all of the questions that I'm seeing. Let me double check Facebook real quick. Yep, we're good there. Um, so with that, I would like to thank all of you guys. Um, I'm also going to throw a shameless plug for Sea Grant in there. Um, we're here to help you get all that information and connect you between all the different industries, science, uh, resource managers. Uh, this is part three of our Oyster webinar, but please feel free to go uh, check out past um, part one and part two. We talked a little bit more about the ecology and then also the resilience and, and aquaculture specifically. So um, all of those are recorded. They're on our website. Uh, they are also on our YouTube page. That's what it is. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that you have a way to look at our web page. Oh, it's going to start from the beginning. Uh, we also have an upcoming uh, webinar, so a focus on Louisiana oil spills. Um, so that will be September 23rd, so that's coming up. We also have a number of different state events uh, where we're highlighting the research that's been done in each of the Gulf states over the past 10 years um, since Deepwater Horizon. So that's a, a highlight and a celebration of this research that we've been able to do with Gulf Marine. Um, and finally, I, in the both chats, you will see an evaluation form. Um, if you would please give us your feedback, your comments, your questions, anything like that, we'd really appreciate um, your perspective on those things. And it helps us build our, our upcoming program. So if there's anything you have further questions on or another subject that you would like to discuss, please share it with us. Um, we'd, we'd love to know more about that. So uh, check out Sea Grant, fill out the evaluation. Uh, thank you very much to all of our speakers. I really appreciate your time. Um, as we continue through hurricane season, everybody stay safe. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. With that, I will sign off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.